being true to your gospel of grace and it is my privilege for you to stand on this stage today somebody help me give pastor ben daily a warm welcome come on somebody While you're standing, I want you to give Jesus a good hand clap of praise. Would you do that? Wow. Wow. I said I can't come to California if I'm not with my good friend, Pastor Robert. And if I don't get any worship from Jimmy Mena, I'm not coming. And uh, I'm so thankful that they drove here tonight to be a part. Would you lift up your hands, hold them up high, every one of you. Would you do that, please? Father, tonight we refuse to tolerate the poison of unbelief in our hearts. The fact is, many of us, we have believed a lie. We've believed a lie about ourselves and our salvation. But tonight I feel this. We are done blaming the devil for our own faithlessness. As the gospel is preached, may we again discover our completeness and perfection as seen from your point of view. I'm asking, would you open our eyes to what you see, what you know, what you say about us in reference to the finished work of your son. Jesus is what you believe about us. I thank you tonight for the measure of faith to believe and receive. And I believe tonight prophetically it's a night of lasting freedom. As a matter of fact, I want every one of you to say it out loud. Say, tonight is a night of lasting freedom. Now I want you to make it personal. Say, tonight is my night of lasting freedom. I know you sang about it, but if you believe it, clap your hands and give God the best praise you've given him. Come on, all day long. Wow. Well, you can be seated. Take your Bibles. Turn with me, please, to 1 Timothy chapter 1. While you're going there, I was thinking a moment ago, you know, you only have three options when you consider what to do with your life. You can waste it, you can spend it, or you can invest it. And I want to say to your pastor and his wife, thank you. I want to say thank you for investing your lives. Not wasting them, not spending them, but investing them in what? Investing your lives in something that will outlast them. I'm so thankful that you're a part of my life and I'm a part of your life. We're so blessed, GCCM, to have your voice. If you are thankful for your pastors, clap your hands and give God praise. The Bible says they're gifts. I think you can do better than that. Come on. Y'all are blessed. Wow. 1 Timothy 1, I want to begin at verse number 15. Reading from a contemporary translation. I can testify, the writer says, that the word is true and deserves to be received by all. For Jesus Christ came into the world to bring sinners back to life, even me, the worst. Yet, I was captured by grace so that Jesus Christ 
could display in and through me the outpouring of his spirit as a pattern to be seen for all those, watch this, who would simply believe. I was captured by grace. My newest book, Captured by Grace, Be Freed from Fear, so you can really live. Chapter one, deception versus truth. I called it the war is over. And in that chapter, I tell this story, true story. When World War II came to an end, it was a time of great joy and great celebration. Uh, proverbial swords were beaten into plowshares. Prisoners were set free. And millions of soldiers went home to their families. But one man, his name was Second Lieutenant Onada of the Imperial Japanese Army, he chose not to believe broadcasts announcing the end of the war. Think about this. For the next 29 years, 29 years, Lieutenant Onada hid in the jungles of the Philippines refusing to come home. And knowing he was still out there, the authorities tried to reach him with the news, the good news, the war is over. However, Onada dismissed leaflets left by the islanders as nothing but enemy propaganda, and he considered letters and family photos and newspapers dropped from planes as nothing more than, you know, a clever trick. And then in 1974, a Japanese student, a college student, made it his personal quest to track down the holdout. And after trekking through the jungle, the student found the old soldier and befriended him, but he could not convince him. Listen, he could not convince him to surrender. Well, eventually, the Japanese government sent Onada's former commanding officer into the jungle with orders, watch, orders to stand down. And so relieved of duty, Onada uh, emptied the bullets from his rifle, turned in his weapon for him, watch, after nearly 30 years the war was finally over, and he actually returned home to a hero's welcome. Now think about it. Watch. I'm going somewhere. For three decades, Lieutenant Onada was engaged in a war. He who has ears to hear, may you hear the Spirit of God. He was engaged in a war that only existed in his mind against an imaginary enemy that he both feared and distrusted. And I tell you this story because this is how many of you, this is how many people relate to God. They are opposed to God in their own minds, or they think that God is gunning for them on account of their sin. They have not heard that there has been a cessation of hostilities. It's called good news, that the war has been fought. The war has already been won. And by the way, the Prince of Peace now sits on the throne. So ignorant of this good news and very fearful of God, they are laying low in the jungles. I know about this, laying low in the jungles of religion, laying low in the jungles of godless uh, deception. God hates them. That's what they think. God hates them. His anger is mounting, and they're not sure what God's Doing. They don't know what kind of mood God's in today, and they expect him to show up any day, and when he does, there is going to be hell to pay. I wrote the book Captured by Grace for one simple reason. Y'all ready? Say yes. Yeah. Most 
people, even many people who've gone to church their entire lives, they still have not heard the gospel. The gospel, the good news, right? The good news. But what is the news and what makes it so good? Oh, I know you grew up in church and you heard the word gospel. But what is the gospel, the good news? What is the news? What makes it so good? How do I know most people still haven't heard the gospel? Because most of you are unaware of who God is and what he really thinks, what he believes about you. That's the faith of God. What God already believes true about you. Or perhaps a whole lot of people, they've heard the good news, but they don't don't believe it. It just does not fit in their grid. It's too good to be true. So what do they do? They live a lie remaining in the jungle. Watch, tired, worn out, frustrated, burned out, fighting a war. Watch, that's already over, refusing to come home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if the truth be told, most of us have lived or are currently living in this kind of jungle spiritually. But I really believe tonight by the Spirit of God that Jesus, our commander, he is stepping into our jungle and he is calling us. I sense the Spirit of God tonight, I'm telling you. He is calling us to a radical kind of freedom, a lasting freedom. Church, you better hear me. Only grace can give you lasting freedom. But for many, many people, freedom is an uncomfortable proposition. Freedom, fact is, how sad is this? I'm talking to church folk. Freedom is a scary word for people who have been trained their entire lives to live under legalism, to live under moralism, to live under man-made religiosity, to live under churchianity. Are y'all getting this? And just like God, I thought about the Israelites, which is a picture. Just like God, when he delivered the Israelites into freedom from the harsh rule of law, right? Law under Pharaoh in Egypt. It did not take long for them to demonstrate that they didn't know what to do with this newfound freedom. And God had offered them a deliverance from Egypt to the promised land. The picture is from law to grace. But as soon as they had their freedom secured, y'all getting this? Say yes. As soon as the Red Sea, what a picture, swallowed up Pharaoh's armies behind them, the fear and the frustration set in. And I'm telling you, I hear it in the church today. Can you hear the children of Israel? What are you talking about, Mo? Who's going to feed us? Who's going to provide for us? Who's going to take care of us? out in this dry place. Yeah, we were oppressed in the land of Egypt. Yeah, Mo, we were beat up and burned out and broken down from 400 years of slavery. But we bonded with our captors and we'd slowly gotten used to the idea that even though we were slaves, at least we were guaranteed three meals a day. And now, Mo, you are telling us to blindly trust. Do you mean, preacher, you're telling us to blindly trust that the God of our ancestors is going to provide quail and going to provide manna and going to provide springs of water to sustain us. You expect us to walk by faith through the desert following a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. This freedom thing, Mo, it's scary. It's unpredictable. Can't we go back to Egypt? Don't that sound like the church? And sadly, that is how far too many of us, yeah, us Christians, that's how far too many of us are living our lives set free by the grace of God the moment you trusted. But dwelling in freedom, take a deep breath. Dwelling in freedom Walking in grace, living by faith, 
without a bunch of religious rules and regulations. That just sounds, I can't tell you how many people I hear, that just sounds a little too loosey-goosey to me, preacher. I'd rather go back to Egypt. I'd rather go back to my former jungle where at least my surroundings were familiar even if I was miserable there. I don't know who I'm talking to tonight, but lift up your hands, every one of you. Hold them up high. I'm telling you, I sense the Spirit of God tonight, friends. It is time, I declare, for lasting freedom. I prophesy. It is time for you tonight to be captured by grace. It is time for you to walk out, some of you tonight, out of the jungle once and for all. It's time to leave the Egypt of sin and slavery behind. It's time for you, I don't know who I'm talking to, to enjoy the promised land. And by the way, our promised land is not a piece of real estate. Our promised land is a person. Jesus is our land of abundance and provision. And if I got a church that believes it, don't make me beg. Clap your hands and give God praise. Hallelujah. Holler it out. Say, thank you, Jesus. That's the greatest statement of faith right there. Because I think back to when I lived in that jungle, that jungle of religion, I always felt dirty and distant to God instead of clean and close to God. In fact, that's why I wrote a chapter in my book called Dirty Versus Close. In fact, it is the longing, did you know, of every human heart, every one of you, to be loved and cherished, to be wanted, to be adored, with no strings attached. And when we read the story, I get it, let me talk. When we read the story of Scripture, it does not take long before we realize the stark contrast between how people felt about God, not God felt about people, how people felt about God in the Old Covenant and how they felt about God in the New Covenant. One, Old Covenant, pre-cross, New Covenant, post-cross. And I don't have time tonight, I'm not here to do this or teach a class on this, but we could look at many, many different examples of this contrast. Um, and some of you students of scripture, I get it. You are familiar in a church that teaches you and you are very familiar with this contrast. You know, when you read the Old Testament, it was a time when, you know, the presence of God, they said, was so terrifying and overwhelming to the people. And they were commanded, you know, to keep their distance. And, and there were borders drawn around Mount Sinai and there were strict rules for entering the Holy of Holies. But what we discover as the story continues to unfold is that it was never God's heart to exclude anyone. The, the, these things weren't on, were, were, were only what? They were only, the Bible says, a, a shadow of the substance that was to come in Christ Jesus. In the old, it's Jesus concealed. In the new, it's Jesus revealed. And by the time you get to the new, we see Jesus. Here he is, the temple, the human temple of God on earth. And what does he do? He starts touching. He gets close. He starts touching lepers and touching blind people. And he healing the sick and he's indiscriminate in his love for both the high roller and the and the low lifers the elites and the outcasts and he was criticized by the religious hierarchy for getting too close too too close to the ragamuffins and was given the title as a friend of sinner and by the way that was not intended to be a compliment uh, in those days and and these two depictions of God the one we see provoking fear and and trembling in the old uh, and the one drawing near to the lost and the broken in the new is the reason that some of you are having trouble understanding how the two depictions fit together. But this is why it is so critical that you understand what the Bible says about, watch, rightly dividing the Word of God. Rightly dividing. There's a portion of scripture that says this, study to show yourself approved of God, a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of God. 
And when we'd hear that, you know, when the preacher said it, you better study to show yourself approved of God. I thought you had to know Hebrew and Greek. Study to show yourself approved of God. And if I knew that, then God, you know, he would be pleased with me. He would approve of me. But that's not what it says. It says, study. What are we doing tonight? Talk to me, church. What are we doing tonight? Watch. Study to show yourself, not God. Study to show yourself what? Study to show yourself, watch, how approved you already are of God. When you know how approved you already are, you can be a workman that never needs to be ashamed. Watch, because you know how to rightly divide the Word of God. Rightly dividing means what? Knowing what's true in relationship to the old and what's true in relationship to the new. The problem the church is having today, watch, they still hadn't decided what side of the cross they want to live on. You know what I've realized? The church just isn't convinced that the cross changed anything. Because in the old covenant, we were afraid to get close to God. But in the new covenant, we're affirmed because God has come close to us. Smile when I talk to you because I'm a good news preacher. In the old covenant, our ascension produced fear. Watch. In the new covenant, his descension produced faith. Mount Sinai was all about man getting to God. Mount Zion was all about God getting to man. In the old covenant, you were required to climb mountains. In the new covenant, you're required to simply speak to mountains. You don't want this tonight. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. That's what I thought. You're slow, but you're worth waiting for. Come on. <laughs> if we only believe in the God of Sinai, we might conclude that we can never you know, do enough, do enough. That's why some of you look so tired. Never do enough, do enough, do enough, do enough to please him. But then on the other hand, if we understand that because of Jesus, our connection to God has been radically, come on, and eternally changed. And that's when we know, take a deep breath, we can finally rest. There's a word you don't hear in church much. Rest, 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 rest. Rest in the abundant provision of God's grace. Lift up your hands, every one of you that are tired, worn out, burned out. May you hear the invitation of Jesus in Matthew 11 when he said, Come to me, all you who are tired and worn out and burned out, and I will give you, watch, rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find, watch, rest for your soul. I don't know who feels like they are losing their minds, lost your sanity. I have never seen so many church people literally losing their sanity. Jesus said, I will give you not just any kind of rest, but rest for your soul. I'll give you your mind back. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. I came up in church where it wasn't easy and light. It was hard and heavy. But Jesus said my yoke is easy my burden is light I'm watching the church literally lose their mind because of panic and hyper hyper uh, patriotism and I'm telling you when's the church gonna get it it's Jesus it's time to be brought back to a revelation you losing your mind because you're focused on everything else and Jesus said come to me and when you do I'll give you rest if you believe it clap your hands and give God is that all you got tonight Hallelujah. I'll give you rest. Rest for your soul. My God. Years ago, I decided, man, I told my church, I, I'm moving my pulpit, man, from wrestling to rest. I'm, I'm moving my pulpit from Mount Sinai to Zion. I'm moving my ministry from the ministry of Moses to the ministry of Jesus, from condemnation to affirmation. I wish the church would get this. Sinai only imposed divine standards, but it was Zion that imparted divine life, God life. Sinai condemned the sinner, but Zion 
redeem the sinner. Sinai, the Bible says, shuts every mouth, but Zion opens up every mouth in praise. Sinai says, you better do this or you're going to die. And Zion says, it's done. Why don't you go ahead and live? Sinai says, try. You better do your best. But Zion says, trust and rest. Sinai says, the wages of sin is death. But Zion says, the gift of God is eternal life. Sinai reveals man's sin, but Zion reveals God's love. Sinai demands obedience, but Zion gives you the power to obey. Sinai was written, the Bible says, on stone, but Zion was written where? On your heart. Sinai began begins or brings us into bondage. It's Zion that sets us free and brings us into liberty. It's Sinai that ends with a curse, but it's Zion that ends with a blessing. When's the church going to get it? The cross changed everything, and Zion is calling us to a higher place of praise. Lift up your hands, every one of you. Say it out loud. Say, the cross changed everything. Say it again. The cross changed everything. And if you believe it, clap your hands and give God praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. The cross changed everything. Everything. Wow. You see, one of the chief reasons Jesus came, and one of the greatest aspects of the salvation that he offers is the ability, and tonight some of you are going to get this for the first time, is the ability to enjoy. Y'all ready? Say yes. yes. Irreversible closeness with God. And if we're going to enjoy that kind of freedom and that kind of relationship to the fullest, you know what I've realized? We've got to expose some lies, correct some lies that we've been led to believe, I think, while laying low in the jungles. And these lies may have come through, I don't know, I'm not even here to figure it out, but they may have come through, you know, misunderstanding of the Bible, they may have come through bad religious teaching, through whoever, they may have come from any number of things. But, but I want to address a few of them, maybe one, maybe two, I don't know how much time I'm going to get tonight, but, 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 but it's knowing truth, watch. Well, the truth sets you free. No, it's knowing truth. It's the truth you know that sets you free. And tonight is a night of lasting freedom. You believe it, say yes. I want to I wanna talk to you for just a moment. I want to speak some things prophetically over you, many of you in this room that are ready for freedom. Here's a big lie that kept me in bondage. Watch. Tonight, I'm going to warn you. I'm a gospel preacher. I'm kind of a one-trick pony. I only have one message, Jesus. When are you going to move on to deeper things? Jesus is pretty deep. <laughs> pastor, don't ever move on. When are you going to move on, Pastor? I'm never moving on. I'll build upon, but I'm never moving on. He is the foundation. We build upon. So I know tonight that some of you are either going to get really glad and some of you could get mad. But it's okay because I'm leaving tonight anyway. <laughs> Your pastor's going to have to deal with you. And if you have a problem, email him, not me. Here's a lie that I believed for a long time. Watch. You ready? I must get closer to God. Some of you are mad right now because you came here tonight thinking, I'm going to go to church tonight so that I can get <laughs> closer. And we've all heard this, right? We've all heard preachers, well-meaning Christians say it. We've even sang songs about it. I'm so tired of faithless worship, begging God to do things he's already done. You may even think you read it in the Bible. But what does the Bible really show us? When we realize that we are, here's the pin code that unlocks the new covenant. When we realize that we are, watch, in Christ. 
Oh my God. Our conception of the relationship is radically changed. You see, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, we don't get any closer than being in Christ. Colossians 1 verse 27, we don't get any nearer than Christ being where? In us. 1 Corinthians 6, verse number 17. We don't get any greater intimacy than being one. I didn't say this. Your Bible does. One spirit with the Lord. So think about that for a moment. If you were going to try, some of you are worn out trying, huffing and puffing. I'm telling you, huffing and puffing, trying, trying to get closer to God. Well, if you could, if you could get closer, and if you could try to get closer to God, what would you go about doing? And then after you did whatever you said you had to do to get closer to God, how would you really know you were any closer? And if you got there, how much more work are you going to have to put in to stay where you are? Is closeness with God a feeling? Because I'm going to tell you something. Feelings and emotions are fine, but are they always a reliable source of truth? It is important, let me tell you, church, to know the truth. Closeness is a fact, not a feeling. Take your hand and put it on your belly right now and be reminded minded you are as close to him as you ever are going to be the bible makes the fact of closeness with god abundantly clear and it has absolutely nothing to do with our feelings the bible says we have been brought close to god by the blood of jesus in ephesians 2 the bible says that we have been united to christ forever by the resurrection according to romans 5 verse 10 it's the good news it's the finished work that makes us close and because we've been cleansed because in my book some of you need to realize that I talk about the differences between sins being merely uh, uh, covered and sins being uh, cleansed right Uh, one an old covenant picture one a new covenant reality there's a big difference but because we have been forever cleansed we are forever close to God. You are close. When is the church going to believe this? The number one lie is this notion that if you are a believer, then you need to spend your life worrying about getting close to God. And I came tonight to tell you the truth. The truth of the matter is that you and God, the Bible says, are inseparable if you have trusted in Jesus Christ. Now, you may grow in your experience of God's closeness. We may grow in that experience of intimacy with him through whatever the ups and downs of life. But those subjective experiences do not impede upon the objective reality that those who have put their trust in Christ are as close to God as they ever are going to be literally joined at the spirit level with him. Such good news because this means that all of the huffing and all of the puffing religion has shackled us with can literally be cast aside and we can rest And we can enjoy our union with him. Take your hand, set it on your belly, and be reminded today that you are his mobile home. Wherever you go, he goes. Did you realize, church, you are a walking, talking, living, breathing temple of the Holy Spirit. I don't know who I'm talking to today. I know there's a lot going on in the world. There's a lot of ups and downs. That's why some of you are unstable in every way in your life because you cannot figure out God's mind about you but I came tonight to tell you and some of you need to hear this I don't care what goes on in the world God says I'm not going to leave you I'm not going to forsake you I'm not going to abandon you I'm not going to walk out on you I'm not going to quit on you I'm not going to divorce you and if I got a church that believes it at least a hundred of you jump to your feet open up your mouth and shout right now like you really believe I'm giving you 15 seconds I want those of you that believe I am the temple of the Holy Spirit open up your mouth and give him praise go hallelujah 
When's the church going to get it? You're not trying to get anything from the outside in. You're releasing what's on the inside out. That's what you told me to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. See, my whole life in religion, it was about me getting from here to there, getting from earth to heaven. But the gospel is a revelation. I'm not trying to get from here to there. I'm bringing what's there, watch, here. Here. The kingdom, righteousness, peace, joy. Whatever you need don't come from out here. When are you going to get it? It don't come from out here. Some of you are so frustrated. Let me tell you why. Because you're spending your life on a treasure hunt and don't realize the treasure's already in you. If the church realized what they were packing on the inside, they would flip cities overnight. Are y'all getting this? Pastor, you want me done now? Done now? Okay. If I invited myself, I tell myself I'm going to stay a little longer. Are y'all getting anything tonight? Let me give you another lie. Another lie that I believed. You ready? Here's another one that kept me hiding in the jungle. It's going to mess with you. I must live for Jesus. That little word for almost killed me. Because if it's about what I do for him, guess what? I'll never feel like I do enough. And nowhere in the new covenant does it say we do anything for him. Watch this. It says in him. In him. In him I lived and moved and had my being, and now watch, in me, he lives and moves and has his being. I must live for Jesus. Well, I know that sounds very biblical, doesn't it? I mean, I heard it my whole life. I mean, of course, we're, we're, you know, we're to live our lives for Jesus, and we've heard, so, heard, heard that so many times, I can't, even, I can't even count it. Well, well, what if I told you, y'all, that Christianity is not about living for Jesus, but that Christianity, you don't want this, is actually Christ himself living his life in and through us. I'm going to tell you why some of you are so sick and tired of the cycles in your life. And I know the cycles because I've lived them. Isolation, motivation, compensation, dedication, rededication, and then a rededication on the rededication, and then isolation, and then compensation, and then dedication, And then rededication. And rededication on the rededication. Are y'all getting this? Jesus did not come to offer us, believe it or not, a sin management program. Watch. Jesus did not come to offer you a self-improvement program. He actually came to offer you a self-replacement program. By which he crucified. You don't want this. He crucified the old you and raised you up to newness of life. In fact, I wish the church would get this. He came to identify so much with us. Fact of the matter is, Jesus didn't simply come for us. He came as us, the substitutionary man. He came to identify so much with us that when he died, the Bible says, we died. That's why Paul said, I was crucified with Christ. When he died, we died. When he rose, we rose. We were co-crucified and co-raised with Christ. Matter of fact, one contemporary translation of Psalm 23 says that there's a six-course meal that we eat every day in the presence of our enemies, that we were, what a meal, co-crucified. We were co-buried. We were co-quickened. We were co-raised. We were co-seated. And now we co-reign with Christ. I don't know who I'm talking to, but life is not going to reign over you. You are going to reign in life. I prophesy it will not overcome you you, you will overcome it. And if I got any overcomers in the house, shout right now. (laughs) 
I'm not making this stuff up. Colossians 3, 4, you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. <laughs> Man, I spent my life, if I had time to tell you my story for years, my spiritual life, some of you know what I'm talking about. It felt like a grind. Man, this is where the church is at. Duty. No beauty. It's emphasized over Jesus only. But like a branch on the vine, man. Man, I spent my life, I'd been squeezing, man, working hard. Squeezing the branch, trying really hard to pressure the fruit to come out. That's how a whole lot of you look in our prayer meetings. Just trying real hard. Popping blood vessels. But when I finally take a deep breath, when I finally quit trying, see, I'm I'm having you breathe because some of you I sense, man, it's like life is choking you. I finally started trusting in Jesus' revelation of the vine and the branches that I'm one with him. She said, I'm the vine, you're the branch, we're one, we're connected. Watch the sap is in the vine and when I'm connected to the vine as the branch the sap that flows in that vine effortlessly flows in the branch and that flow man I prophesy over some of you tonight that flow oh you're going to know love and joy and peace and power and freedom I'm telling you more than you even thought possible lift up your hands there's an anointing right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you is the greatest statement of faith. Right now with hands lifted in your own words, just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now look at me. I'm going to finish with this. I'm not going to stay here long, but I'm going to finish with this. Because I'm telling you, this is where some of you, for the first time tonight, y'all ready for freedom? Say yes. yes. Lasting freedom. Say yes. yes. This revelation right here changed everything for me. I lived under this lie for so long. And some of you, I got a chapter in my book called Slow Suicide. Some of you are absolutely frustrated. You live in perpetual frustration. And I'm going to tell you why. It is frustrating spending your life trying to kill off something that's already dead. Okay. 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 Here's the lie that I lived under. You ready? I must die to myself. I don't have time to teach on all this tonight. The content is in the book and some of you need it because you've got to understand what the Bible says but some of you need a revelation about the war being over. And some of you need to grab hold of the truth. The truth of the matter is, if you trusted in Christ Jesus, take a deep breath. You already died with him. Your old man, the old you, has been crucified with Christ. See, some of you are fighting. You think that old man, no, let me tell you, he's already dead. And Paul says in Galatians 2 that you no longer live, but Christ lives in you. And the life you now live in the body, you live by the faith, what God believes true. The faith of the Son of God. The faith of God who loved you and gave himself for you. Church, I did not make this stuff up. Paul said in Romans 6, 6, old self was crucified with Christ. You look at Paul's choice of words there. Was crucified. Not is being. Was. Past tense. Dead, dusted, done, buried. The old you. I get it. Some of you struggling. The old you was unfixable. I get it. He was broken. He was corrupted. He was completely screwy. He was a slave to sin who lived for himself. And no amount of trying, no amount of reform could fix him. But the good news is this, and I came to preach it tonight, that he is 
dead. That hopeless old so-and-so was nailed to the cross with Jesus and the Bible says no longer lives. What died? Let me tell you what died. Your fallen personality, who you were in Adam. The reason why some of you have a hard time hearing preaching like this is because I'm a gospel preacher. I don't talk to who you were in Adam. I talk to who you are in Christ. Your old depressed self already died. Your old suicidal self already died. Your old sinful self died. Your old addicted self died. Your old fearful you was buried. The old anxious you, the old stressed out, worried you took the bullet. Your poverty died with him. Your sickness died with him. Every bit of darkness and disease that you once were died with him. Your old road rage took a tumble. Your old religious self was crucified with him. The new you, lift up your hands, hold them up high. As a matter of fact, I feel an anointing. Jump to your feet right now if you can. Lift up your hands, every one of you. Hold them up high. The new you is free. The new you is alive. The new you is full of life. The new you is full of love. The new you is full of faith. The new you, the true self, is prosperous. The new you is bold. The new you, the new you is overflowing with confidence, peace, and fruitfulness. The old critical, introverted you is dead. The old addicted, struggling you is dead. The new self is completely restored. I'm talking to you, to innocence, to childlike innocence and trust. And ultimately, the new you is righteous. The new you is pure. Do you know why we gather in the church? We gather because sometimes you have a tendency to forget. But when we gather around the Lord's table, we do it in remembrance. When we gather around the baptismal, we do it in remembrance. When we hear gospel preaching, we do it in remembrance. Let me prophesy. Lift up your hands. You need to be reminded that you are a saint and you're a trophy of Christ's victory. That you are eternally redeemed and you are completely forgiven. That you are seated with Christ in heavenly realms. That you are righteous. You are not guilty. You are entirely pleasing to God. You are holy. You are blameless. You are healed. You are strong in the Lord. You are highly favored. You are blessed with every spiritual blessing. You're a joint heir with Christ. I prophesy you are bona fide. You are qualified. You are anointed from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. You are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. You are bold as a lion and you are not free. You are lastingly free. You are free and who the Son sets free is is free indeed and if I got a church that believes it give God is that all you got today let me hear a church that believes it that's called the gospel Listen, saints, God isn't trying to kill you off. And he's not asking you to do it either. He already did that the moment you believed. And when Jesus went to the cross, he took you with him. And when Jesus laid in a tomb, (laughs) he took you with him. And when Jesus rose to new life, He included you in him. And I sense the spirit of the Lord in this house that it's time for you to take those old grave clothes off once and for all and begin walking in the royal robe of righteousness that was purchased for you. I'm telling you, Pastor, you are moving into a moment of freedom in this house. Freedom. I have never been more convinced, Pastor, that it is time for the church, I'm talking about the capital C church, to dive deep into the intricacies of the gospel and discover that every one of us is captured by something. I don't know about every other church, but this one, may this be a house that dives deep into the intricacies of this good news. Because some of you, let me tell you, you are not captured by grace. Some of you standing here today, and I know I'm talking to you, but you are captured by distraction. 
You're distracted by everything going on in the world. You're distracted by the economy. You're distracted by politics. You're distracted by what he said and she said. You are distracted. You're captured by distraction. Some of you are captured by compromise. You're captured by legalism. You are captured by moralism. Some of you are captured by man-made religiosity. Some of you have been captured by churchianity. You have been captured, some of you, by the jungle of believing me and God are still at war and you are not convinced of the gospel. May faith rise up on the inside of you tonight. Some of you are captured by sin. You are captured by guilt. You are captured by shame. You are captured by condemnation. Some of you are captured by fear. You are captured by anxiety. Some of you are captured by lack and longing. But tonight... May you be captured by God's grace. Don't clap. When I count to three, if I'm talking to you and you're ready for freedom, and I told you not any kind of freedom, a lasting freedom, if I'm talking to you, I'm not going to beg. I'm not going to plead. I'm not going to hustle. I'm not going to scream. But those of you that want freedom, lasting freedom, and you say, it's mine, I'm ready. I want to be captured by grace. I'm ready. When I count to three, you hold your hand up high so I can see you. Tonight is your night. Let me tell you, I'm not going to wait long, but I do want to speak some things prophetically over you, over your family tonight. If I'm talking to you, hold it up high so I can see you. One, don't you wait. If you're ready for lasting freedom, two, when I say three, hold it up high. One, two, three. Let me see. If your hand is lifted right now, I can't.